All right, hello and welcome to another episode of Colonial Outcast, your friendly neighborhood anti-imperialist podcast, because imperialism, as we hold here, is bad for the global south. It's bad for you and only truly benefits the top 0.1%, uh, which you, sorry, most likely will never be. But hey, keep dreaming. Uh, since So since the hostilities slash genocide kicked off in early October, I've been trying to rally and platform more military and veteran voices uh, to speak out against U.S. and Israeli policy is both morally reprehensible, murderous, and again, inherently self-destructive. Uh, veterans have an important niche within activism circles because it's harder to dismiss us as radical leftist, hippie, commie fucks, and it's hard to dismiss guys who have engaged the Taliban, Islamic State, and Al-Qaeda, who we now have a great working relationship with in Yemen, by the way, as terrorist sympathizers. Also, we know that the word terrorist is meant to cudgel the commoners essentially back into line so they don't question foreign policy. I don't know if these two others uh, share my view, but that's definitely my personal opinion about the word. So to discuss as veterans how we came to this political anti-war, anti-interventionalist position. Uh, I've got myself, Greg Stoker, a former U.S. Army Ranger. We've got Travis, a show regular at this point and a former field artillery officer, and Josephine Gilbo, a recently separated military intelligence officer. So thank you all for taking 30 minutes out of your day this morning to talk about how you got to this point and, well, how we know that Israel isn't really targeting Hamas. I think that's a good two-point discussion to send to other vets who are still on the fence about this whole thing. So thanks for coming on, y'all. Glad to be here. Yep. Thanks for having me. All right. So, uh, Josephine, we recently got into contact because uh, TRT uh, World, the uh, the, new, the media platform, picked up uh, your interview outside of a protest in D.C. or in a protest in D.C. where you were. A vigil for Aaron Bushnell. Oh, OK. It was a vigil for Aaron Bushnell. Yes. All right. Um, and you basically hit on some points that I've been saying since uh, late October. Essentially, uh, it was a video uh, taken outside of Aaron Bushnell's funeral. And uh, the, the points you discussed were, you know, um, well, you targeting. started targeting and uh, politicians because you've been lobbying in DC too, in uniform. Yeah, in so if you, yeah, let's like rewind a little bit um, okay. to back to October. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I'm a 17 year military veteran. I've worked in the intelligence community, both within the DOD and other agencies, um, actually. And I came to this conclusion because about seven years ago, I had an assignment where I was following local, local news media in the Middle East. And so when October 7th kicked off, and I was seeing all the local news media in the Middle East posting what was happening versus what we were hearing on the ground i was like whoa this is so completely different like it was sometimes i would see things happening and it kind of was the same but this was like really different in a sense of what we were hearing and the information coming out of what was happening so that's when i did my super deep dive into what was actually happening there I spent weeks reading about the historical context uh, behind how Israel was created, what happened to the Palestinians for 75 years, and then what was actually happening on the ground. And a way that I was able to validate that was using Snapchat's location feature where you can zoom into public snaps that are posted by anybody in the world. And so there were hundreds of civilians in Gaza posting public snaps of what was actually happening, which still was just completely different than what our media and um, government officials were set telling us on the podium. And so I ended up connecting with a lawyer from northern Gaza who now has been displaced five times and is in Rafah dying of hepatitis A. And he and I um, were able to really get deeper into what has been going on there, what has been happening, who Hamas is, what the Israeli occupation looks like for them. And when he started dying from hepatitis A, I got in my car, put my military uniform on and drove to Congress, pissed. And I was met with uh, John Fetterman, waving oh, an Israeli flag in my face. And that was the first time in my career or as a human 
in America that I was like, whoa, okay, our government is super corrupt. There is something deeper going on here that I ha I have no idea. This is not about national security. This is not about self-defense. There is something going on deeper here because why is John Fetterman from Pennsylvania, this like union worker guy, super patriotic to Israel? It just right didn't make sense. So I dug deeper into that and found out about APAC. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Money. And so here I am bringing awareness to the truth of what's happening here and the truth of the corruption that exists in the legislative branch and the executive branch. Absolutely. And, and when we talk about lobbying, the, the corruption within our government, lobbying is essentially you can conceptualize it as legal corruption, legal bribes for political favors. Like there's well, something if you lobby with money. Mm hmm. Because I, in lobbying, I've met other organizations that are lobbying for like more benefits for people who might be blind, or there were people lobbying for youth homelessness. There's, there's lobbying in a sense of trying to bring awareness to our congressional leaders who may not know about a specific subject or topic and you want to just bring awareness to that. And then there's lobbying where you sign this very big check and say, I'll keep you in office, I'll support your campaign, but you have to vote in a way that supports what I'm telling you. Yeah, that's a great call out because uh, it's a, there's a big difference between lobbying for an interest or lobbying for uh, you know an issue and lobbying for a foreign government, right? I mean, it still kind of blows my that's mind right. that that's even legal. That's right. And I did some research about yeah. that. Why aren't they uh, registered under the FAIR Act? Yeah no lawyers have come together to actually take this to court and make a de a big deal about it and so they just yeah well because under the radar yeah because they're um, i mean a lot of it's, you you hit on it right like we'll, we'll we'll get you elected or we'll get you you know we'll get you elected next time and the adverse is also true if you don't take our money this is apac this is apac's playbook right if you don't take our money we'll get you primaried we'll work very hard to get you primaried and get you defeated yeah. and and they seem to be they seem to be more their, their penetration seems to be even more ubiquitous than most PACs because you have people like uh, I'm from I'm originally from California. You have people like Katie Porter who ran on, you know, you know, and stumped and stumped and stumped on. I won't take PAC money. I don't take special interest money. But she did take a PAC money, you know, and it's, yes. it's like, yeah, if you're going to take one, they're going to take that one. And, and the penetration across both parties is insane. You know, there's, yes. there's not a lot of special interests like that where you're like, Oh, you have 97 percent of all of our elected officials you know or something like yes. that 95 it's that but I, I will tell you this the past two days apac has been lobbying inside of congress and they are being met with palestinians with people advocating for gaza and it was so bad that one of the guys even asked for security from the capitol police because he was being bombarded by people and and that just goes to show you that there are cracks in that empire there are cracks and when there's cracks it'll fall down eventually i got, a, I got an instagram message from them that said uh we're looking for americans to tell uh pro-israel stories essentially post pro-israel stories and i was like I, th I think you're barking up the wrong tree bud but you know i always make it a point to comment underneath their sponsored ads to call them out for being terrorists yeah guys nice. yeah i mean uh th that's another thing i wanted to talk about this word of terrorist uh, this mobilization of it because um you know uh i think like a as vets we kind of have a, a shield against that kind of uh, but like what I get mostly uh, in order to di discredit me because I've been very vocal about this and I have a somewhat of a big platform uh, where I, I dr do draw some heat is uh, either I'm accused of stolen valor, which is like their first one, you know, uh, and if, if you don't know what that is for all the listeners, that's where you essentially lie about military service, like what you've done, what unit you are in, awards you are given. Uh, which is actually a really dumb thing to accuse someone of because it's so easy to disprove. You literally have a piece of paper because the military does a lot of paperwork and, you know, you can just show that. It, it, um, specific, it specifically attacked his, his unit awards on his uniform, which is hilarious because oh, half, been half, half, the army sold, half the soldiers in uniform are wearing the wrong unit, unit awards. That's why, I, that's why I chose to do this podcast in front of this. Yeah. 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 So, 
So, uh, yeah, they, I mean, so they, they can accuse us of stolen valor or like being a disgrace to our uniform. And at this point, I'm just like, whatever, dude. Like, you, you don't really know what was like going on, like overseas in a war like Afghanistan, where it's just like, okay, was this really ever something that was meant to be won or was it just an exercise in like, it's beyond the no, scope I, of this conversation? I agree but, with but, yeah. you, Greg. I've really found myself questioning a lot of my assignments, a lot of things that I've participated in. I've really found myself questioning what was the truth behind those missions and were those people actually guilty of something? Yeah, it's it's weighing heavy. And I think a lot of veterans are actually starting to contemplate that who are being educated on this situation. The biggest hiccup right now with some of these veterans, like what you're saying right now, is they're uneducated and unaware of actually what's happening. And they're taking at face value what the Western media is telling them instead of doing their own digging. That, and that disparity is huge. And who's surprised when you find out that you've got, you know, domestic uh, you know, or national news organizations running their copy through their Tel Aviv desk for censor approval from the Israeli government before it gets released in the United States, which is which is just insane. I mean, show me, where, show me another country where that happens. Uh, yeah, you know, my husband actually made a really good statement about why veterans may be choosing to keep their head in the sand because he's a 12 year Navy vet. And he said the reality of someone finding out that what they did during their time in the military wasn't for the greater good and actually was for the elite is so heavy that facing that would mean we might have a lot more Aaron Bushnell. Yeah, Greg and I talked. Greg and I talked about this like right, like October eighth, literally, like around that time we were having these conversations. Where it's like, because we were finding the same thing. Some 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 vets would immediately go with new information, realize, oh crap, this is what's actually going on, and a lot of them would be very resistant. And it's because it requires a look in the mirror. The second you start looking into that. Now you're looking at yourself in the mirror. Now you're looking yeah. at your history. And, you know, for a lot of us, our former identities were very, very tied up in what we did. And so yeah. it's a hard look. It is. And, and it's heavy. I mean, we do heavy things. So it's heavy to face. It, it, when it comes to serving the interests of the elite, what the, re, the when I started to realize this, when I started uh, going into more uh, intelligence capacity and I started having to get uh, – more versed in coin operations, which is, if you don't know, the uh, American counterinsurgency doctrine that we're using in Af Iraq and Afghanistan. And McChrystal's office put out this slide, uh, coin dynamics and security. Uh, basically all of this, and we, everybody got this, and everybody had to study this, and everybody was like, what the fuck over? Um, just on a very basic surface level, I started to intuitively think like, is this a war meant to be won? because what the hell is going on here? Um, and not just that, when it came to Afghanistan, like, and, and I was involved in like kinetic strike targeting, uh, Josephine and I were talking about this before uh, when we first connected, like there are people in Gaza, uh, you know, th that are apparently connected to Hamas because, you know, everybody is connected. Um, so like, just because he made like a phone call to a guy who may have been connected to Hamas, well, that guy's eating a Hellfire missile from a drone when he turns on his cell phone in Gaza. And if it was happening in Afghanistan under Obama's insane drone strike policies, which were inherently a war crime, uh, what's happening in the Strip? And that's and, and, and there's a huge difference there, too, because you, 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 the, the, the scenario is awesome, right? In Afghanistan, you make that phone call or you receive that phone call and you eat a Hellfire. That's not, that's not what's happening there, right? You get, mm -hmm. some first or, you get some second or third order connection, supposedly, I would argue they're not targeting anything, but yeah, I, I would argue they're targeting they're targeting they're targeting population density centers, but yeah, um, you know, and instead of a they're hellfire, destroying which, infrastructure, yeah, which is, which is a you know a direct fire, uh, you know, point to point munition of limited of limited yield, they're dropping GBU, they're dropping two thousand pound you know GBUs on there. Some guy didn't, some not, um, in a city, and we were talking about when you know how how kind of how we all started switching around how we viewed this. One of the biggest points for me. Uh, it started slowly longer ago when I actually went to Israel and was like, this is a propaganda tour that I'm on right now. But um, but it, the the real point was when I started watching them drop 2,000 pound bombs into have dense urban environments. And as an artillery officer, I'm looking at this going, your stated goals were counterinsurgency and hostage rescue. I, I've never seen anyone do that 
with the GBU series bombs in an urban environment. That's that's not how that works. That's insane, you know. Right. So let me ask you that question. As someone who was an artillery officer, whenever you are assessing if you're going to drop a bomb in a location, what what do you assess as far as civilian casualties? Yeah, what does that look like in Greg, the world? Greg made a video on this. Maybe we can link it later. But we made a video. Greg made a video on this. But going through the entire like NATO checklist or you know the U.S. The U.S. military's checklist of of what is you know what is the facility, what is the population density, what are the likely casualties, are there you know, are, are there religious sites? Like there's 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 a whole rule set that says this is this category of target, this is this category of target, and and based on the amount of collateral damage for that target, that equates to a clearance level. And the stuff that Israel is dropping in the U.S. military would be a two star. You would need a, you need a division commander to sign off on any of the stuff they're dropping. That's clearly not happening. Or if it is, that's even worse. But yeah, uh, and it wouldn't be a it wouldn't be a blanket authorization. It would be no. like one piece of paper signed per strike, and they've got they're they're dropping like what they've done like eight eighty thousand strikes that like we wouldn't have cleared. Oh, no, it's insane. I, and, and and you know another another comparative point, right? To, to us or to our backgrounds is none of that was dropped in Baghdad ever. GBU, GBUs were not dropped in apartment blocks and residential centers in Baghdad ever during the entire prosecution of the war. GBUs were dropped. So on this goes to back to the question of yeah. why are we supporting an ally so unconditionally that doesn't align with our own military street strategies and uh, values and moral compass. So how do we continue to support someone that knowingly drops bombs on dozens of children every day? That doesn't make sense to me. No, it doesn't. I mean, it, it, it makes sense uh, through the lens of imperialism. Uh, I think, you know, even dating back to 1947, tra uh, Travis is currently getting some memos written by the uh, post-World War II Joint Chiefs saying that uh, the creation of the state of Israel will cause regional instability. It'll be a net negative for the United States in that region and globally because uh, it will diminish our reputation. But aside from that, we also do have CIA reports saying like, hey, uh, Palestine is a small, quote, economically weak, uh, a, a militarily weak country whose economic potential uh, far outstrips its military capacity. And, you know, we need to establish a base there in order to repel Soviet incursion into West Asia and also to secure American energy security uh, because it is the outlet for Middle Eastern oil, or at least they thought it would be. Yeah, that my friend from Gaza actually told me yesterday that that border that they built between the north and the south of Gaza, they've now created a road that goes right into where not, where they're building the port. Within 24 hours of Biden announcing that they're building a port, they were able to get all the construction machinery in. They've already started building the port. So to me, it seems like this was just a propaganda scheme the entire time. Mm -hmm. And most of the people in Gaza do believe that this is going to fall right into um, being a port for them to extract the resources that exist in the Mediterranean Sea. Yeah, it, it, if they build a road like that, you know what? The, you know they're going to fence the north side and the south side of that road. It's going to. It's yes, it's right. all, it already is blocked, totally blocked off, so and they, now they, they built a the road into yep. two segments now, into two different security segments where people yep. won't move freely again. Yeah, right. Uh, not only that is I, I was talking to some Navy uh, CBs and those are guys from the Navy Construction Battalion. If you're not tracking uh, for the listeners, uh, they can build a temporary port in like no time. It doesn't it wouldn't it wouldn't take 10 months. So uh, what that says is they're not building a temporary port. They're having to use uh, more intensive construction techniques to build a permanent. Port. Yes. Yeah. The, the, the US, the US yes. You know what? I'm so glad you said that because I know that the horizontal and vertical engineer units have equipment that it's almost like a barge that yeah. like flaps open into and so you can even like it's almost like a port ship that's what i was saying they don't they don't actually have to build anything the navy they don't even has, have to build anything yeah the navy has amphibs they can pull in and they just put down yes. and then boom you gotta you gotta dock yeah so, also also, um, in conjunction with this port, um, 
Israel is just purchasing, spending $150 million to uh, purchase a port in Larnaca, Cyprus, uh, where the aid is going to go through. It's ostensibly to inspect the aid, but they're building another port on the other side. They're buying a port on the other side of the Gaza Marine Basin. Uh, so they'll have this port triangle between uh, Cyprus, Gaza, and Haifa. You know, uh, it was, so, I, start, I started seeing I started seeing local demonstrations in Cyprus against one the airstrips being used for for attacks and and now this this expansion. That's it. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, uh, because Cyprus, uh, you know, still houses two UK air bases, which they which is in sortie range fighter sortie range of Yemen. So in case you're not tracking, they are taking fighters are taking off from Cyprus to bomb Yemen. And I actually just did a, a, a podcast that's going to be released later today about Cyprus uh, I, with an international Cypriot relations, uh, international relations specialist from there. But yeah, um, not only that is the idea of the uh, East Med, Eastern Mediterranean oil pipeline, which died in 2001 because it was like politically unfeasible is now back on the table. You have Ursula van der Leyen from the EU, which uh, Claire Dowley calls proud genocide, going to Cyprus to do something. You and know, the Hague isn't good enough for you. Yeah, and the Hague isn't good enough for you. So yeah, it, it seems like uh, a lot of projects are being envisioned right now. Not, it's not just the East Med Euro pipe, uh, East Med pipeline that has been reinvigorated. It's also the Mumbai to Europe through Abu Dhabi and Dubai, new Silk Road uh, that's going to uh, feed through Israel into Europe. It, that's also tied into all of this. So um, when it comes to Western imperialism, it's always look for where the money is and the special interests. I got yeah. an interesting. Can I, I want to I ask you a question because, you know, you, you talked about at the outset um, following like local journalist movements and stuff like that. I think what what do you what do you think about what um, the the target the, the targeting of journalists in in Gaza in in Palestine? Well, I, I think I think initial. So when I first started watching what was unfolding, they were still in the north, invading in the north. So I've been able to watch them go all the way down Gaza Strip, Khan Yunus, now Rafa. So I think what started happening was. Um, the, their PR couldn't keep up with um, debunking the algorithm of social media, spreading the awareness. And so, of course, they they were able to link up with Instagram, Facebook, Meta to try and do some censorship. For example, my name, the hashtag of my name on Instagram goes against community guidelines. I'm like, <laughs> I haven't even said anything as extreme as that guy. <laughs> He's calling Israel terrorists. I haven't even said anything like that, but I'm censored. Yeah, I don't but know how I, mean, I haven't been censored. <laughs> you no, know, but the, the point is they, they're targeting journalists because it's making an impact. And in order to try and stop the impact, they're targeting them. But here's the thing. For every one journalist that's died, I've seen like three more take on a press suit and start being a journalist. So yeah, it's, it's almost like the logic of force and collective punishment aren't going to work. No, also, no. Also in your video that was uh, on TRT world, you talked about, you know, the ISR capabilities, the intelligence surveillance reconnaissance, like what, what we would call drone footage. Um, you know, the, the, incredibly advanced sex sensor technology. So when you shoot a Hellfire missile at a car that says press on the top of it, you can see exactly what you're shooting. There's exactly. no there's no well, two ways you know, about it. There's no excuse in the 20, 2023. Okay, here, here's like one of the most right. interesting things is when we go through intelligence school, we're sort of told that the Israeli intelligence is one of the greatest intelligence communities in the world and they have all these capabilities and they're super smart strategic and i'm like well, i'm not seeing that they're either committing a genocide which is what it looks like to me and to the rest of the world or they really are not very good intelligence analysts because they're just dropping bombs everywhere and claiming that it's hamas so the targeting aspect of things People need to realize, and veterans especially need to realize, 
that coming from someone who is one of the strongest armies in the world to be doing this and to say we didn't know or there were human shields the human shield concept i'm going to tell you this in america if there is an active shooter inside of an elementary school we drop two thousand pound bomb on it Duh. are we gonna drop two thousand pounds of bombs on the school knowing that the children are inside or are we gonna do some sort of urban op to take him out yeah what are we gonna do here i, I, and saw, someone else, I, do, I saw someone else the expectation we need yeah, yeah I, I, I saw someone else rephrase that same point as like, what if, what if, the, what if Hamas wasn't in his uh, Tel Aviv hospital, with the with the idea of bomb that hospital? Exactly. You know, I mean, I mean, exactly. for in order to not be hypocrites and for consistency's sake, we need to start dropping active shooters in hospitals and schools. Yes, if there's an active shooter in an elementary school, according to Israeli government's um, strat strategies, you must bomb the entire school. Yep. That's what this term human shield that they keep referring to means in a sense of a, a, an American concept. Yeah, 100%. but also, also I just, like- I just wanna ask her a question about something she said, Greg, real quick. Yeah. Uh, you, you you were talking about the like competent, competence level and we've, we've, we've looked at competence level on the ground, just watching operations and you know how units are performing in the field, how, like what the kind of security they're pulling, how close Hamas is getting to them, you know, stuff like that, stuff that we can see and know. Um, I'm curious if you have seen examples of competence level you know, on their in their on their intel side because I, I have to assume yeah. if the army looks this degraded in amateur hour, you know, in these components, I'm curious is the intel section the same way? You know, well, actually, I think that the Israeli forces have an understanding that they lack competence both in intelligence um, strategy, in field strategy, which is why they're dropping bombs mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they don't have the ability to actually do urban ops and take out these high level commanders Agreed. so they just keep dropping bombs these are reservists that hardly ever do any field training obviously and they're doing TikToks. that it blows my mind they're doing TikToks in the middle of a war i don't recall ever doing that even during field training Right. And and also, I, I keep trying to bring this up, and I bring it up all the time, but in case there are other vets uh, listening, their entire military doctrine is based on collective civilian punishment. In 2006, when, they, uh, when the IDF invaded southern Lebanon, they got rolled up real quick by Hezbollah. Uh, okay. So what they did was they bombed, they carpet bombed the shit out of a suburb in West Beirut called Daia, and because what they wanted to do was hurt the civilians so badly that if Hezbollah ever tried to attack them again, the civilian population in Lebanon would stop them. It's a completely absurd um, doctrine to have for your military, but it serves the core. It's the, at the core of Israeli policy on the uh, ground um, operational policy. And so, uh basically what they're doing and the only thing they can do again because they are a conscript military whose leaders are quote unequipped to fight a real war that's from a official an official um U u.s army liter literature from the 2006 war uh they they put collective punishment on civilians in order to pressure the combatants to lay down arms and that is Collective punishment, obviously, which is a war crime. Their entire military doctrine is, in effect, a war crime. Yeah, well, Greg, let's talk a little bit for a second about the combatants themselves. Yeah. And who is Hamas? Because I feel like people keep saying Hamas, Hamas, terrorists, Hamas, terrorists, and mm -hmm. don't actually take a look at the group, I the mission of the group, the backing, the background of the group. And I think it's important that as veterans, we touch on who these people actually are and what their goal is so that people don't put them into the same category as, let's say, ISIS. Yeah, I, I remember one of my Joes in Baghdad in 07 during the surge talking about a group that had just attacked us and kind of loosely using the phrase terrorists. And I remember telling him, you know, hey, these guys attacked us. We're, uni we're, we're uniform military target 
you know, uh, uh, I, didn't, I, didn't say, I didn't say occupying at the time, but I was like in their country. I, I like, say foreign invaders. Yeah, it was like when you shoot at us, I was explaining it, like when you shoot at us, that's not terrorism, that's insurgency. And, you know, we've done it too. So look, I, the example I use is I was born and raised in Louisiana. Every single person that I know has a weapon there to use, whether it's to hunt, self defense. And if someone invades South Louisiana below I 10, I guarantee you that we are going to defend our land from any foreign invader. And then in this situation, we would be labeled a terrorist for protecting our children and our land. And that's sort of what's happening with Hamas here. For 75 years, their people have been targeted over and over. Their children have been targeted. Their economics have been targeted. I mean, in every aspect, they have been dehumanized there's no freedom of movement. And so what do you think is gonna happen when you push people into a corner for generation after generation? You have these teenage boys who watch their, their, their parents get killed, their siblings get killed. If that were us here in America, we already know what we're about to do. I think it's especially, that's an especially good message for veterans because it's like you voluntarily picked up a rifle with none of those circumstances. Yes. Think about if you had grown up in that environment, you whatever militant group was present that's where you would be i also want to say having been to jrtc i would rather smoke myself than invade southern louisiana but um <laughs> <Poor Pope. laughs> <Woo -hoo. laughs> yeah but yeah like that, that's a, to me that's a message that i i've i've had conversations with other veterans and that one that one resonates because it's like hey okay you did this you joined up you joined the military anyway and your parents were fine and your neighborhood was fine yeah well, imagine you're, this, you're, telling you're not yeah, joining exactly yeah. imagine you have this this culture and these families and these people that for 75 years have been getting attacked. What do you think they're going to eventually do? I mean, it's inevitable that they're going to resist. Absolutely. And uh, it's not just that, like when, when we use the, when the, when the average person uses the term terrorist, it, it's either because of, you know, Islamophobia generally, because, you know, cartels use objectively terror tactics, but we don't call them terrorists necessarily. Um, but it comes down to tactics. You know, people think like, oh, they're terrorists, they're suicide bombers, they use explosive belts, they use nerve gas. It's like, according to the Is Israeli, Israel's Ministry of War, the last suicide bombing by Hamas was in 2008. <laughs> They, they've completely rebranded as well. So That's when it comes good, to terror, you know, yeah, when it comes to like tactics, yeah. And especially like thinking and thinking about it from like targeting terms or like, our, you know, US military terms, to me, like what defines terrorism and, and doesn't is effects. Like what is the desired effects? Because if you yeah, look at like, the FBI, the FBI goes, you're a terrorist if you're a foreign actor and affiliated with a foreign terrorist organization. The FBI says domestically, you're a terrorist if you commit illegal acts in support of an ideology, then the FBI will call you a terrorist. I, I was just reading their definitions just out of curiosity. But to me, what makes a terrorist or not is effects. What were your desired effects? Were your desired effects, you know, inflicting uh, uh, damage and trauma on the civilian population or civilians? Because if that's the case, then yes, you know, or at least that specific behavior was, um, you know. But again, if you're attacking, if you're attacking military forces or armed forces of any kind, you know, as we saw on October 7th, I mean, a lot of those kibbutzes are armed. Those aren't civilians. When you pick up a rifle, you're not a civilian, you know, and so I think yeah, I think it's important for us to really look at the criteria of what our government is labeling terrorists. For example, the Houthis, they were blockading the Red Sea, which is a nonviolent way to respond to what's happening in Gaza, which is a genocide. It was a nonviolent way to respond, yet they were called terrorists for doing that. And to me, that was sort of the equivalent of putting sanctions on a country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, the only the only gray area there for me, because obviously I would su I'd support a blockade. Obviously, I think that is right. And, and, I'll, and I'll also add they declared war on Israel. So if they attack ships, they've already declared war. This is already under a different, completely different context. The only area where they made it a little fuzzy was when they were firing any ship missiles at arguably civilian craft. Uh, seizing, seizing, you know, helicopter landing, seizing a civilian craft, enforcing a blockade. These are all activities that I think are very black and white. Um, yeah, shooting they up, had, shooting I will say though that, yeah. that happened. However, as Israel likes to say, they were warned. 
<laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, by by their own rules. Israel, right? gave, yeah. Israel gave a twelve story building two days ago a one minute warning to evacuate. The Houthis for weeks and weeks have said, "Do not pass. You're not allowed to pass. If you do pass, we're going to respond appropriately." Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, if, if you fuck with the money, you get labeled with a terrorist. Uh, exactly. As a terrorist. That, yeah, I think that's, that's what people really need to become aware of. What is a terrorist? How are people getting labeled terrorists? Are we sure that they're meeting the criteria of what a terrorist actually is? Or is it just fucking with the elite's money? And so now they're a terrorist. Yeah. And you, we also got to remember, anytime we talk about the Houthis or Yemen in general, we're talking about a, a, a people, regardless of what political faction you're speaking about, but you're talking about a people who have been under the same type of tactics that, that the yeah. uh, that the Israelis are using in Gaza, the Saudis have been using in Yemen for years. And who, you know, who supplies them? Same yes. mass, same actors. Yes. Same result. Yeah, and people, uh, I, I guess one thing I keep hearing in the media is like, oh, the Houthis are just using this to like rebrand and, you know, become a regional player and like reshape their image. It's like, and so, and, and Russia's doing the same thing because they're speaking out against the genocide, and so is China. And that's another point. Like, even for the really cynical, like, global security people, it's like, yeah, they are. They're all looking better than we are right now. You see why unconditionally supporting Israel is a bad idea for U.S. national security. And it's Thank like, you. Like there you said right? it. It is bad for U.S. national security. And that is how you tie back to the congressional leaders, the executive branch, who truly do not care about our national security, because on an international level, we are being viewed as the bully. New alliances are being made. Str older alliances are becoming stronger. And so to, to say that they're doing this for our national security, absolutely not. Absolutely not. No, no it's, it's, also, it's also making the world in general a whole lot less safe because every time a global order changes, maybe, maybe it's for the best, but like there's some rocky times ahead. Yeah, We're going into completely, yeah. completely unprecedented waters right now. Yeah, the the, 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 yeah. the memos that we brought up earlier uh, from, from, four, from 47, like literally it's General Marshall telling Truman, if, if you recognize, uh, if you recognize Israel, it's going to ruin our relationship with everybody else in the region. It's going to lead to the U S involvement in stupid, unnecessary wars, and it's going to damage U S security. And he Marshall went so far as telling Truman, if you do this, I'm not voting for you next time because you're trading, you're trading popular votes for, for U S security. And, and all I, of this I strongly believe that if the Western media would have covered this, um, truthfully without bias, that the entire American population would be moving even quicker to get our congressional leaders to stop sending aid and weapons and even maybe do more, like stop them. With that disparity is insane, right? Like even even as what it only took till like November to where you had a majority of the U.S. population supporting ceasefire, you know, it, it crossed over into a majority, I think, in November. And we're now, you know, we're now in March. So, yes, the, the behavior of our government versus population's opinion here is so, so disparate. It's insane. Well, every time they come up to the podium and tell us something, uh, Secretary Blinken, John Kirby, President Biden, President Biden was saying that the war was going to end by the end of the year last year. Mm -hmm. We're going into March. So everything that they say at the podium isn't coming into fruition. And so you know what that tells me? The Israeli government and Netanyahu are completely rogue. Mm -hmm. There are serious cracks between the relationship of the United States and the Israeli government. You heard they that do not agree at all on how they're carrying this out. Mm -hmm. Yet we continue to send them weapons and they're not even listening to us on how to use them and follow international law. Yeah, you heard that Biden hot mic, where, right? Where he's like, you know, Netanyahu needs to come to Jesus moment here. I think he well, needs more than Jesus at this point. <laughs> awkward, awkward phrasing given the uh, people involved, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, he needs to come to Jesus moment. Where is it, Joe? Where is yeah. it? You, you, send you, it. You, yeah, you know, you know how you make him have a uh, come to Jesus moment. You cut use your you cut him off, and also use your executive power to uh, get APAC to register as a foreign agent. That that would that would be a great start. Yeah. 
So the a ceasefire at this point is the minimum of what the Palestinian people need. Um, people need to be prosecuted for war crimes. People need to be cr- prosecuted for um, breaking international law. This is not just going to be give me a ceasefire and let's go on about our life. No, this is going to end the way the Holocaust ended with the Nazi regimes getting prosecuted for war crimes, the Netanyahu's, the cabinet, and hopefully even some of our legislative officials get prosecuted for war crimes. Yeah, the evidence in the the evidence that we have right now is just what the Palestinians could film and record and transmit with no internet, no power, all getting murdered the entire time. You know, Greg has brought this up before. The UN is terrible at stopping genocides, but it's great at doing it's great at doing, you know, the, the investigative work after the fact. I mean, look at the whole cause. They didn't have any of these things. They didn't have social media, video evidence or anything. They had witness testimony and they were able to prosecute these people. And that's how this has to end. A ceasefire is the start. Prosecution is the is the finish line. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, y'all. Well, I think it's South by and I've got a bunch of stuff to do. It's like the big networking opportunity here. It's this massive festival in Austin, but um, we're, we're kind of out of time here. I wanted to thank you guys so much for coming on and hitting these points uh, about just like basic stuff, but like, we're still trying to bring people on board it. And again, as you said, this is going to take a long time. A ceasefire is a very conservative, still a very conservative position on, on this matter. And, you know, b- there's going to have to be a whole, uh, reconstruction process. There's going to be a whole activism against building this pipeline, cutting Gaza into two, uh, stealing Palestinian oil reserves, which a are theirs. Or oh, a one-state solution, or a one-state solution, whatever yeah. the solution is going to be. Once journalists, once journalists can freely get back into Gaza, they're hosed. Because yeah. I, I truly think that what we know now is like a, a tiny percentage of the picture that we're going to get after all of this is broken out and investigated. And I, I'd be amazed if, I mean, if, if we're already at a majority for ceasefire, I, I think where the world populations are gonna be yeah. uh, after like the full truth comes out. I, yeah. Yeah, it, it, I do it, wanna it, ask you guys, what do you think is gonna unfold here in the next like week or two in Rafa? Uh, if, well, we, we've made videos, Travis and I have made videos about this before, uh, an actual ground assault into Rafa is operationally infeasible and quite insane. Not only do you think they're going to carry it out. I mean, I think at worst, at best or at worst, they will go in. They'll send units into Rafa, shoot a bunch of shit, and then be like, "Hamas is defeated." So now we can like total pull victory. Out. Total like, victory. I've never seen a situation like this, but it's literally to the point where the the literal human density is so high that I don't even know how you move units. In, in and around the area. We, we're, well, we're you know, in Al Mawasi, which was supposedly a safe zone, yeah, but not even that it's a safe zone. There, just right on top of the tents. They, yeah, the yeah. tents literally roll on top of the tents, filled with women, children, men, and yeah. just roll on top of them. This has come up before. I keep, I keep, uh, I keep looking at this, going, "That's insane," and then not realizing who I'm talking about, and that they'll do it anyway. Yeah, because, because the description we were talking about was like. Rafa right now, you basically take like the Lower East Side or any any built up urban area, and then take take an entire refugee camp and stick it on top of it, and that's that's your operating environment. You know, you know that's, that's why a lot of people from Rafa have not left Rafa, even though they've been given this like warning to evacuate because these supposed safe zones that they were going to evacuate to, they're finding yeah. out that tanks are rolling over the tents and killing people, so they're not going to go there. They're just going to take their chances where they are. Because they already are so malnutrition, they don't even have the energy to even be able to walk miles and miles to this new location where they're rolling over people with tanks anyway. No, and I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't put, I would never put it past them to do that on purpose. They've done it before. We've seen it before. I just want to add that like from a, from a mechanized unit standpoint, it's hard enough not to run your own guys over during operate during you know uh, kinetic operations with when you're when you're using mechanized forces it happens occasionally you know on you can the u.s bases it's happened occasionally every couple of years someone gets killed by a vehicle so now take that multiply it by a thousand and you're rolling through you know a refugee camp with a mech unit even if you were trying not to that would still happen yes it's horrible guys it's horrible yeah i agree yeah so ceasefire now i think we should do another one of these soon um it was great. Hopefully this was helpful to some people. Hopefully you can send it to some of your relatives who 
you know, still don't know what to think about this. Uh, so, right. Uh, I do want to say one thing that's important mm -hmm. when we start touching on veterans coming to this awareness that we should maybe try and provide some sort of like, um, outlet for them, mm -hmm. like veterans for peace about face. So maybe like at the end of your video, you can say like any veterans that come to this awareness, reach out to these organizations. They're filled with people who can help you navigate that. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Uh, I'm actually in touch with Veterans for Peace. Good. I will link I will link their social media, uh, their Instagram uh, and other platforms in the description of this video. So, yeah, otherwise we're going to go from 22 suicides a day to like 100. Yeah. yeah. Let's not do that. All right, y'all. Uh, let's circle back uh, soon. And uh, thanks so much for coming on. Hope you all have a great day. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.